All right. Class is now in session. Everybody take out a sheet of paper because as promised, we're going to take the quiz. Convert 6.12 degrees into degrees, minutes, and seconds. And all trigonometric functions evaluated on this triangle. Your second question. And last but not least, prove this identity.
What does it say? Yeah. It says H. <coughs> You're okay. It did look like an ambiguous symbol. You have about four more minutes, maybe five more minutes. Be sure to show as much work as possible. A right answer with no work or justification will receive half credit. So you have to show why you believe your answer is the answer.
All right, you don't have to turn in just yet. I'll give you a minute to wrap up, put your final justification, final answer, last ditch contribution, and then you can turn it in. And your quiz will be how I take attendance. All right, let's pass them in. Don't be your name's on it. Make sure your name is on it. There we go. All right. Quickly, would you guys like to go over it? Okay. This thing, 60 degrees is just 60 degrees. So this thing is the same thing as 60 degrees plus 0 0.12 degrees, right? So we wish to just analyze this portion because this is the only thing that can change. 60 degrees is, is a whole, whole number. So it stays degrees. This is the one thing that's smaller than one degree. So we can convert that to minutes and seconds. So let's take then, um, that implies I get 0 0.12 degrees times in one degree, I have 60 seconds, right? So I cancel out the units of degrees to see how many, uh, did I say seconds? I mean minutes. So let's see uh, how many minutes that is. And plug that into our, my calculator here, 0.12 times 60. Come on, number locks, Zero, uh, 0 0.12 times 60. That's 7.2, right? Is that what you guys get? So 7.2 minutes, okay? Notice that 7.2 minutes is seven minutes plus 0 0.2 minutes. So this is a whole number. We keep it whole. We keep that whole. So we wish to break down this further to a smaller unit of measurement, right? So this implies I get 0 0.2 minutes. And we know that in one minute, there's 60 seconds, right? So the units of minutes cancel. And so what is double that? Uh, got 0 0.2 times 60, double, okay, 12. So this becomes 12 seconds. So this thing is the same thing as 60 degrees, seven minutes, 12 seconds. That's it. So with these problems, you know, take the whole part and the decimal part, break down the decimal part into the what's this first degree of smaller unit, which is the minute. Then when you get that, you take the whole value, you let it be, it's actually going to go up there. Then you break down its decimal to what its, what its representation is in the smaller unit. So we put a 12 there. Okay. Here. You have to solve for the hypotenuse using the Pythagorean theorem. 
So it's five. So then I'm going to erase this because I need some space. So now that we have the hypotenuse sine of theta is opposite four over hypotenuse five. And then it's reciprocal cosecant theta is just five over four, flip it. Cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse, which is three over five. It's reciprocal secant theta will be five over three. Tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. So it's reciprocal cotangent theta is three over four. So that's that one. And now let's prove this guy. Started off with the more complicated side. From the denominator, I notice this has a sign. This has a sign. I can mutually factor out a sign out of each term. Immediately notice that this is, is a product between sine and one, the quantity one plus cosine of theta. Notice that this and this cancel. So we just get this is equal to one over sine of theta, which by definition is cosecant theta. Code errata demonstrata. Okay. All right. You guys writing this down? Everybody knows how to do all these? All good. Very good. Everybody should be getting hundreds. Oh, and I guess I guess there is the recorded part where you could just rewatch it. I'm still thinking it's the olden days. Still thinking it's the olden days. So to clarify the string of emails that seem contradictory, uh, Tuesday we went over 1.4. Today we'll be going over 2.1. The reason 1.4 homework is not due today, I've extended it to being due Tuesday, is because I didn't upload which problems you were supposed to do until yesterday. I should have done them Tuesday morning right after class. That was an error on my part, and you guys should not be punished for having one whole day less to do your assignment. So I gave you the extension to doing 1.4 and 2.1 right here, what we're going to go over today. That will be due Tuesday. Okay. If, I, if we go to our Canvas page here, um, go to announcements. Do, do you guys get emails when I make an announcement on Canvas? You get notified that there's an announcement because that's how I upload the homework stuff. So I've uploaded what the homework for this section is already and for 1.4. So then on Tuesday, we'll go over 2.2. And on Thursday, there'll be a quiz next Thursday. So every Thursday, we're going to have a quiz. Let's go over 2.1. Right triangle trigonometry. Well, let's say we have a 30 60 triangle like so. That's a right triangle. Let's say it has these following values. Recall from the earlier sections the properties of 30, 60, 90 triangles. Okay. Um, this just means x can be any factor of 2, 3, uh, root 3, 1, 
we can pick any number x. Let's say, someone give me a random number. Two. two. I can pick x to be equal to two, all right? That means I can create a triangle, or in this case, it will be much bigger. Like this, that's still a 30, 60, 90 triangle with the same angles. It's just been expanded. It's been scaled up. Furthermore, I could pick a number less than one, like one half. Then this will scale our triangle like so. It's still a 30, 60, 90 triangle though, OK? So that's what this X implies. X means it, we, can, we can let it be anything. If we let it be a large number, it'll make our triangle expand. If we make it a, a fraction, it'll make our triangle contract. Now, let's determine what the sine, cosine, and tangent of 30 is. What's the sine of 30 degrees? Yeah, it's opposite, which is x, over hypotenuse, which is 2x. Notice the x is canceled. I get it equals 1 half. So sine of 30 is 1 half. What is the cosine of 30? It'd be the adjacent root 3x over hypotenuse 2x. x is cancel again, so I get root 3 over 2. So this is a powerful statement. Notice how cool of a statement this is. This is actually implying that no matter how much we scale our triangle, we can make this triangle become as big as the planet Earth. And we can make this triangle as small as a fundamental particle, like an electron, or a positron, or a photon, or a neutrino. And still, the proportion of the 30, 60, 90 legs of the triangle remain. The sine of a very tiny triangle is still uh, 30, 60, 90. The sine of 30 of a very tiny triangle is still 1 half. And the cosine of a really tiny triangle or a really huge triangle the size of our galaxy is still root three over two. Isn't that incredible? That those ratios are preserved no matter how much we scale the triangle. All right, that's an amazing result. It speaks truths that are not, there's, there's still truths in this stuff that we still don't know. This is just some of it that we've discovered as human beings. Now, what is the tangent of 30 degrees? Okay, um, tangent, so remember, we're, we're looking at the reference angle 30 degrees. Oh. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, so you're close. It's x over root 3x. Right. Notice that the x's cancel, so I just get 1 over root 3. Then I have to rationalize the denominator. We typically do that in mathematics. So I multiply the top and bottom by a fancy number 1. So I get root 3 over 3 as my results for tangent theta. So. Now, what is cotangent of theta? Or what is cotangent of 30 degrees? Let's let theta equal 30. And this needs to say 30. What is the cotangent of 30 degrees? Three over root three is correct. And then we have to rationalize this again. So we multiply top and bottom by a fancy number one. 
because anything divided by itself is 1. And anything times 1 is itself. So I can put it equals. So this becomes root 3, 3, all over 3. And the 3s cancel to get a root 3. So this is my cotangent of 30 degrees. What is my cosecant of 30 degrees? How are you getting that? If it is two, I don't even know if it is yet. Tell me how are you getting that? Well, cosecant is one over sine. Uh -huh. So you just split those variables and that's just two over one, which is two. Correct. I like that. I like that much better. Clearly, I'm making you talk more. I like it when you guys talk. I like it when you guys are responding. Of course, you don't. Well, actually, some syllabuses say students are encouraged to participate X, Y, Z. But you know what? Some people are just shy. Some people don't want to talk. But I'm going to try and get you guys to talk. Um, I'm going to try and get it out of you. And here's why. It benefits not only you, the student who is talking, but also your colleagues which are listening to you elaborate, right? So not only do you improve by participating verbally, but also you're helping your colleagues improve. And there's merit to helping others, right? Helping other people is a good thing, right? So what about secant of 30? What is it and how did you come up with it? You're supposed to flip um, the cosine, so it would be 2 over square root of 3, but then you have to use the rational. Excellent. So what do I multiply top and bottom by? Square root of 3. Square root of 3 over square root of 3. Results in a 2 root 3 all over 3. This is my secant of 30. Or secant of 30 degrees. All right. We found sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, cosecant, secant. There we go. Time to now evaluate. What is the sine of 60 degrees? How are you getting that? Right, this is the reference angle. Now, opposite is root 3 x. Hypotenuse is 2 x. Cancel the x's out. I just get root 3 over 2. That's what sine of 60 is. Let me ask you another interesting question. What was the cosine of 30 again? Forgot. I erased it. 3 over 2. <coughs> Wait, but isn't that sine of 60? Yes, you just looked at it. This is what we got for cosine of 30. But that's the same thing as sine of 60? That's correct, because depending on what angle you're at, the opposite leg and the adjacent leg changes. Over here at 30 degrees, the opposite leg is x. Over here at 60 degrees, the opposite leg now becomes root 3 over uh, root 3x, right? So once you guys take that into account, now we can really start doing more and more trigonometry here. So let's do cosine of 60 degrees. What is that? X over 
Yes. Adjacent over hypotenuse. So this reduces to one half. And if you have good memory, unlike me, you will remember that that was actually the sine of 60. Or, uh, oops, sine of 30, right? That was actually the sine of 30. Interesting. Interesting. What is the tangent of 60? Tangent is opposite over adjacent. So what's the opposite of 60 degrees? Which, what's the leg value? Excellent. And what is this adjacent? So we get it's equal to root 3. That's what tangent of 60 is. What was tangent of 30? Root 3 over 3. Because tangent is opposite over adjacent. So I had 1 over root 3. Rationalizing the denominator got me root 3 over 3. Okay. What is secant of 60 degrees? Two. Why? Because you're uh, flipping the two and the one. So it becomes two over one, and anything divided by one is itself is just two. Make sure you guys understand this properly, because this is going to come up over and over again in different applications. Okay. Now, cosecant of sixty. What is that? And why? Two over the square root of three, but then we have to rationalize. You said what? For cosecant, it would be um, a square root of, or two over square root of three. Where are you getting that? Uh, because that's what sine is, and you're supposed to just flip it. But then now we also have to rationalize. Ah. So multiply top and bottom by root three over root three. So I get two root three all over three. That's what cosecant of sixty is. What is the cotangent of 60? It would be 1 over the square root of 3. Mm -hmm. But then you have to rationalize. Yes. So it becomes your 3 over 3. Very good. So now that we've mastered that, let's talk about embedding triangles in two-dimensional Euclidean space, also known as our Cartesian coordinate system. So who's familiar with this x, y axis stuff? Who's familiar with it? I'm familiar with it, so I'm raising my hand. Who else is familiar with it? A lot of people are familiar with it. Okay. Historically, the French mathematician Rene Descartes saw a bug on a wall. He's just chilling there like you guys are sitting there. And he saw a bug on a wall. And he noticed, hey, I can determine where that bug is if I were to somehow measure how high it is off of the wall. And measure, but that's a length, a straight length. And also measure how far away it is from the other wall. So it's like the bugs here, he said I can measure it like this and like that. A vertical component and a horizontal component. So this two piece of information, if this is A and this is B, the bug is located at A comma B. Same thing with our triangles here. 
we can actually parameterize the location of our triangles using Cartesian coordinate system. X, Y. Here's our triangle. Notice that the tip of the triangle here, if this is A and this is B, is equal to A, B. So we can call this P. All right. And notice that we can solve for H. H, nearly the application of Pythagoras' theorem. Even though I told you guys it's not really Pythagoras' theorem. I might just start calling it the Euclidean norm or the standard Euclidean metric. But then Euclid probably stole a lot of ideas too. So we're eventually going to have to call it something. Okay. Notice that there's an associated theta here. So every time there's an associated theta, we can then talk about sine of cosine and theta. Okay. Here comes the very interesting part. Let's create an arbitrary triangle. Let's say it's a theta here, and let's say there's an angle phi. Let's say this is x, this is y, and this is our hypotenuse h. Notice that the sum of the inter internal angles of a triangle in flat space is governed by this equation here. All right. Theta plus phi plus 90 should equal 180, right? The sum of the interior angles of a triangle should equal 180 degrees, right? I like to think about it uh, by saying, okay, why is that true? Well, to form a triangle, all you need is like to get a straight sheet of paper. That straight sheet of paper, when it was straight, had 180 degrees from one end to the other end. Then you folded it and you closed it. But even though you closed it and created edges, there's still 180 degrees in what you had prior. So there's going to be 180 degrees in the new shape. You just rearranged where the angle went before the angle was straight. But then you rearranged where the angle is at in three different locations because you created three different corners. You know me. I like to abstract. So that's one way to think about it. But notice we can solve for phi here. Phi would equal 180 degrees minus 90 degrees. Uh, also, minus theta, right? Notice that this breaks down to 90 degrees minus theta. This is what our phi is. Remember that. I'm going to replace phi with 90 minus theta now. Here's some interesting stuff here that you should have been able to pick up on with what I was hinting at earlier. What is the cosine of theta off of this triangle? Yes. Now let me ask you this. What is the sine of 90 degrees minus theta or the sine of phi? It used to be phi. Believe in yourself. But why should you believe in yourself? Because you're applying your knowledge that you've been told, that you've already learned. Sine of 90 degrees minus theta is opposite, which is x, over hypotenuse, which is h, right? You're just doubting yourself because you think, surely they shouldn't be the same, right?
But the truth is, they are the same. And it's counterintuitive. But this is called being a co-function. This phenomenon is called co-function. Being a co-function. That's actually why cosine is called cosine. Because it is a co-function to sine. So we've established that cosine of theta is the same thing as sine of 90 degrees minus theta. What is the sine of theta? I'll put that here. What is the sine of theta? Y over H, opposite over hypotenuse. And now let me ask you this question. What is the cosine of 90 degrees minus theta? Yeah, because 90 degrees minus theta, uh, uh, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. But to this angle, the adjacent leg is now Y. This is why you shouldn't memorize stuff. Memorization doesn't get you this stuff. Application of the definition gets you this stuff because now it changes. So if you always think cosine is x over h and sine is y over h, you would have got you wouldn't. This dot doesn't apply. So you have to understand. Cosine is the adjacent leg over the hypotenuse leg, and no matter what angle I pick, I can do that. So actually, this is y over h as well, because cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So take a look. Interestingly enough, sine of theta is equal to cosine of 90 degrees minus theta. That right there is your first two sets, is, 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 your, is our first set of co-function identities right here. We've established co-function identities. Co-function identities. Oh, I erased the triangle. That was kind of important. I'll redraw the triangle here. This is really cool. The cofunction identities are really cool. Uh, that's why cosine has the name cosine, because it is the co-function to sign. What about tangent of theta? What's that equal to? Yeah, well, I got to rewrite the legs. Y, X, Y, and H. Opposite over or opposite over adjacent y over x, very good. Now, what is the cotangent of 90 degrees minus theta? Cotangent. Well, it would, it would be easy if we found what the tangent of 90 degrees minus theta was, right? Let's first ask that question and just flip the result to get the cotangent, right? What is the tangent of 90 degrees minus the theta?
So tangent is opposite over adjacent. So you're right, it's x over y, right? Because opposite to this is x. Adjacent to this is y. So cotangent is just flip that. It should be y over x, right? Holy moly. Holy guacamole. I shouldn't say guacamole has spiritual properties like that. I'm being sacrilegious. Please don't tell all of your pastors that I did that. I repent. Somebody give me one of them whips where you, they used to whip themselves if they ever made a sin or something like that. Did a sinful thing. So here's tangent of theta. It's the same thing as cotangent of 90 degrees minus theta, right? Notice, they're the same. That's why it's called cotangent. Guess what? I can write cotangent of theta, and that would equal tangent of 90 degrees minus theta. You can go and prove that to yourself. So does it make sense why secant has a cosecant buddy? Right? Notice that secant of theta by all this information would be equal to cosecant of 90 degrees minus a theta. And cosecant of theta would be secant of 90 degrees minus a theta. So now we have derived all of our co-function identities. Isn't that cool? You'll see why it's cool when you're stuck with an angle and you don't know how to evaluate it. But then you know, oh, I can evaluate 90 minus that angle. OK? So here's an example here. What is the cotangent of 70, 75 degrees? Uh, Wait, what? What am I talking about? Yeah, here we go. Given cotangent of 75 degrees is equal to 2 minus a root 3 find tangent squared of 15 degrees. How do you guys suggest we do this? I've been wanting to do that. <laughs> How do you guys suggest we do this, guys? Y'all ever notice there's a little pet rock over here? Let me introduce you to my pet rock. His name is Rocky. Rocky Balboa. He's going around. <laughs> that eyes jiggle. It's really funny. <laughs> it's a googly eyed rock. It doesn't take much to entertain me. But sometimes my pet rock is a little not entertaining, so I have to do mathematics. What do you guys suggest? Maybe the fact that the co-function identities are on the board and in boxes, maybe it's a hint on how to solve this problem. I really don't know. What I want to know is what, how should we approach this? That's what I want. I don't want to answer. I don't want root 5, 5 over 3, 36 over 7. I don't want that. I want 
How are we going to attack this problem here? That's what I want to hear. What is your suggestion on how we could find tangent squared of 15 degrees? What would be the first step in our calculation? What, what? Oh, yeah, that's right. Let's utilize the co-function identities. <laughs> Notice that the cotangent of 75 degrees, I can replace 75 here. I can replace theta here with 75. So the cotangent of 75 degrees is the same thing as the tangent of 90 degrees minus 75 degrees. Why am I saying that? Oh, what's 90 minus 75? You are, I know this one. It's 15. <laughs> Take a look. We're getting closer. So now we have this is equal to tangent of 15 degrees. This cotangent of 75 degrees is now equal to tangent of 15 degrees. And we aspire to find the tangent squared of 15 degrees. But recall, the problem gives us that this entity, oh, right here, this entity, cotangent of 75 degrees is equal to 2 minus root 3. So how do we kill off the problem? Pardon me? Square. Square what? The tangent um, of 15 degrees and the 2 squared of 3. Yeah, let's square both sides of the equation here. Right? Square whatever you do to one side, you do the other. So I get 2 minus root 3 quantity squared would be what my tangent of 15 degrees squared would be. Right? This is our result. And of course, trivially, we can compute what that really is. Really, it's just distribution or what you guys have been told is called foiling. I don't like the term foiling because that only works when you multiply a binomial times a binomial. It does not work for a trinomial times a binomial or even a trinomial times a trinomial or even a trinomial times a pentanomial or something like that. But let's just do it. Two minus root three quantity squared is just itself times itself. Then just like when you foil, you have to, oh, I hate saying that. You have to foil this. So two times two is four minus two root three minus 2 root 3 plus a 3 because negative root 3 times itself is positive 3. Does everybody agree? Notice that this 4 and this 3 combine to give me a 7 and these combine to give me a negative 4 root 3. So here's our final answer. This is what tangent squared 15 degrees is. Any questions? So I told you that these identities are really useful, right? Because look, we extracted new information. We were only given what the cotangent of 75 degrees was. And using these cofunction identities, we were able to, to extract the information of what is tangent of 15. And of course, with that information, we can always square it if we'd like. 
And so we squared it. And so now we know what the tangent squared of 15 is, and that's 7 minus 4 root 3. Can you see how this might be useful if you're calculating stuff? For like, I don't know, I guess everybody is typically job oriented. Everyone's like, I need to have a job because I need to pay the bills and buy groceries, right? Everybody's job oriented. Even I'm doing it right now, right? I'm doing this so I can buy some food. I gotta eat. Okay, so even for your job, this stuff is important because let's say you're given a certain piece of information and if you can extract more information out of that, you are now one step ahead. You're helping your company or your boss or whatever. You're, you're an asset because you're able to, out of one starting material, create more stuff out of one piece of information, extract and generate a new piece of information. That is very powerful. Right? Would you not agree? So like, let's think about it. Oh, geez. Got a problem with me, Des? Wanna take this outside? No. <laughs> so uh, let's say we got a starting material, iron ore. You can turn that stuff into all kinds of stuff. Desks, these little thingies for my backpack, staples, uh, ships, airplanes. So the people who figured out how do I turn this hunk of metal into something useful are the ones that are successful. So you figuring out how do I turn information into more information will cause you to be successful. I read on your quiz that we got uh, computer science, computer science, biochem, math ed, undeclared. No. You are declared. Yes. You are undeclared. You are declared. What are you? Environmental? Yes. Yeah, because your thing, your paragraph was about environmental science stuff. Yes. Guess what? Computer software, if you're given some code and you got to generate new code based off of that code, this stuff is applicable. Yes, math is involved with computer science, for sure. Math is involved with, I, I believe you're aspiring to become a doctor or a pharmacist, right? Mathematics is involved there a lot. Of course, you have to know a lot of physiology, chemistry, biology, um, but mathematics is there. You have to calculate just how much I have to, just how much dose of uh, aspirin I must administer to a patient coming in with angina pectoris. Somebody comes into the office, they're having chest pain. I need to be able to know just how many milligrams of aspirin I need to give them in order to prevent a myocardial infarction, which is a technical term for heart attack. Uh, you're undeclared. Math can help you do anything, man. You could go become a mathematician, which is what I secretly want. I want all of you to become mathematicians. Uh, engineer, anything. Mathematics helps with everything. Uh, companies, no matter what they do, will hire a mathematician if you can use your services to help them out. Math Ed, you got to know math so you can teach it really well. You're gonna have a you're gonna have a lot of the curious young kids being like, why? Like, why is this? Why is the area of a triangle one half base times height? And you have to show them. Oh, well, area of a triangle is one half base times height because notice that the area of a square length width is length times width. So when you cut that in half, it's one half length times width. And when you get a triangle, we call, typically call the length base and the w height, so it becomes one half base times height. Bam! There you go, little kid. It's not easy. Critical thinking is not easy. But uh, the better you get at it, the better it will be for you and for your future. Because it will help you solve problems. Okay. Let's do another applied problem. Let's do another application here. I'm going to delete these because they should now make sense. You should be able to come up with them. 
just by understanding, not by memorization. What's the cofunction to tangent? Oh yeah, it has it in its name, cotangent. What's the function, cofunction to sine? Oh yeah, sine is cosine. But cool thing is, the cofunction to cosine is sine. <laughs> so let's do another applied problem. Given alpha and beta are complementary. Proof. Cosine squared alpha is the same thing as one minus cosine squared beta. What did it mean for two angles to be complementary again? Yeah, when you add them together, they equal 90 degrees, right? So here's our proof for this. By assumption that alpha and beta are complementary, we know alpha plus beta should equal 90 degrees, you said? Yeah. I agree. All right. Hmm. So Given that information, how can we use it to prove that cosine squared alpha is equal to 1 minus cosine squared beta? Hmm. Put the cos or subtract cosine squared beta or beta uh, to the other side and then equal them all to 90. So Say that again. So if we pass the cosine squared, uh, yeah, that one to this side, so we subtract it and then equal all of it to 90. But it doesn't equal 90, it equals 1. So, All right. Furthermore, we are not we are trying to prove yeah. that the cosine of that the cosine squared of alpha is equal to one minus cosine squared beta. So doing that step, although it is totally a legitimate step, you can do that. It doesn't serve our purposes. I just want to do it to honor your suggestion. That's totally valid. Doing that is totally valid. But it doesn't serve our purposes of proving this result. The best way to prove this result is to start with one hand of the equation, let's say the left hand, cosine squared alpha. And somehow, through our given pieces of information that this is equal to that, we need to arrive at this ends up equaling 1 minus cosine squared beta. So the only piece of information that we have given to us is that they're complementary, right? And if we start off on this hand, we're evaluating cosine squared alpha. So why don't I solve for what alpha really is? So would it be like getting it alone? Yes. It would be like getting that alpha alone. I subtract the beta from both sides to do that, right? Notice that that's what alpha really is now. Alpha really is 1 minus beta. So I can substitute the alpha here. 1 minus beta. Oh, I mean 90 minus beta. I've deleted those handy dandy co-function identities here. But we are mathematicians and with our brains we can generate them. Recall that cosine of alpha would be the same thing as sine of 90 degrees minus alpha. And that the sine of alpha 
or not even talk about sine. So we'll just do that. Uh, yeah, actually we'll do that. Sine of alpha would be cosine of 90 degrees minus alpha. Now let's talk about beta. Cosine of beta is the same thing as sine of 90 degrees minus beta. And the sine of beta is the same thing as the cosine of 90 degrees minus beta. This is just using our cofunction identities for sine and cosine for the angles alpha and beta. Which of these do you think we can use? One, two, three, four. One of these equations is going to end up being useful here, isn't it? That's right. That last equation. Notice this is almost this, right? It just needs to get squared. So why don't we square both sides of this equation here? I get sine squared beta is then equal to cosine squared 90 degrees minus beta. Oh, take a look. Do you see what I'm talking about? <clears throat> Does everybody see what I'm talking about? That's what I'm talking about. Okay. So that's true, right? But now take a look. We're trying to show that one minus that's equal to one minus cosine squared beta. But what is sine of beta also equal to? Here. So we did that substitution and we squared it, that equals this. But notice, now we've done something. We've converted from alpha to beta. And our expression requires that, right? So now, how can we get to our desired result, 1 minus cosine squared beta? Because right now, we only have a sine squared beta. Which one? Uh huh. Say it. Say it. Say it. What? Sine squared beta equals one minus cosine squared beta. Okay, so you're saying I know sine squared beta plus cosine squared beta is equal to one by the Pythagorean identity, right? That's what you're saying. And then you're saying, oh, if I have a sine squared beta here and a sine squared beta here, I can algebraically solve for sine squared beta here and substitute it there. So that means sine squared beta is equal to 1 minus cosine squared beta. Can everybody see that? Can everybody see that? Oh, look. That means we're done. Because if sine squared beta right here is the same thing as one minus cosine squared beta, then we've done, we're done. We proved it. Sine squared beta is the same thing as one minus cosine squared beta. We proved it. I'm out of space because that would write off of the board. But take a look. 
sine squared beta, well then you could just write equals one minus cosine squared beta. And that was the proof. We started with cosine, cosine squared alpha. We converted the alpha to 90 minus beta. We used the co-function identity to switch to sine squared beta. We utilized the Pythagorean identity for the variable beta to switch and prove this. Your homework is already posted. If you guys have any questions, let me know. If, you got, if you're stuck on a problem, you can feel free to email me. Uh, I, I should have my office hours established next week. I'm teaching at multiple universities, so I haven't been able to tell you guys what my office hours are. That's going to, that's going to get fixed next week, okay? So, but feel free to email me. I'll just snap a picture of the solutions with the descriptions and send it to you. You guys can snap a picture and be like, I'm confused here. What do I do? And it doesn't even have to be off of the homework. You can ask any problem out of this book. Let's say you want to do one of the challenging problems. Feel free to ask me. I'd love to help you solve it. Class is over.